He's Harry. And he's Tim. And we're about to turn paper sideways. You're listening to Turn Paper Sideways, the podcast where we talk about cardboard and rotating it 90 degrees. We talk about all things Magic the Gathering, from current affairs to our favourite format, Commander. And on today's show, we've got part two, surprise part two, of our DIY deck building series. And we'll be giving you some tips on how to upgrade your decks. If you would like to find us on social media, we're on Twitter at TPSMTG. Uh, You can email us for more long-form messages at turnpapersideways at gmail.com. Let us know how much you love the show, how much you don't love the show, or you can complain that your solicitor said you'd be moving on Wednesday and then that they'd email you to confirm it and don't. And now you're confused. You don't really know whether you're moving this week and you just just don't really know what's going on. If you want to complain about that, that's fine. (laughs) Tim, do you want to complain about that? Is your moving I, date I don't know changed? when I'm moving. I'm supposed to... I know, I don't know. That's the problem. I haven't heard anything. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, uh, in the meantime, listeners, <laughs> you could support us by giving five-star <laughs> ratings on iTunes. Uh, you could also like and subscribe to us on YouTube and click that little bell icon to get notifications about when we post videos. And finally, you can support us financially uh, by going to patreon.com slash turnpapersideways and give us as little as a dollar an episode. It goes a really long way to pay our hosting fees and get the sound quality better. And just it just really helps us to grow the Turn Paper Sideways family. Yeah, it does. Tim, would I like to do the news? You would. So the news this week, Tim has got two Commander 2018 decks. How are they? Well, I like both of them. Surprisingly, uh, the one I was most excited about, the Enchantments deck, is not the one I'm most excited about now. Um, My wife very kindly bought me the Sahili Artifacts deck, the red-blue one, and I I love it. It's just, it's just, like Harry said last week, it's just value town. It's just play artifacts, make artifacts cheaper. Make your artifacts better, win, feel great. Just It's just great. And artifacts are colourless, so I can play pretty much all of them. Like, there must be, what, 20 artifacts that can't go in that deck? Maybe a bit more than that. Wow. <laughs> I did get the pleasure of playing against Tim with that artifacts deck. We played some Heads Up EDH uh, while we were together for our Once in a Blue Moon get-together. and yeah, It was wonderful. It was, it was wonderful, <laughs> and those games were so much fun. That yeah. deck really is... I mean, it's quite terrifying to sit opposite. Uh, <laughs> it does get out of the gates really quickly. Yeah, the uh, the plus one um, make your next spell you cast uh, cheaper for each artifact you control. When we evaluated the decks originally, um, we did not uh, kind of overreact enough about that ability. It's mm-hmm. stupid. It's so good. Yeah. And that wasn't even with a really well-tuned deck. You didn't have a single Blightsteel Colossus in that deck. And, no. Uh, there, there weren't any really scary artifacts in it, and it was still fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And the um, the one the one that taps to make... Uh, tap and pay to make a... I think um, it's a servo. Re- recycling you, Foundry or... Yeah, and then you tap it and pay a little called. bit to make that servo into a Thopter. And then you tap it without paying any mana and turn that thopter into a 4-4 construct but what uh, i didn't realize stupid. was it's any thopter so you played um a non-token thopter and you turned that into a construct as well oh, exactly you, you it's... hit value town hard yeah and that's that's because uh, it's a blue deck you can kind of draw go and if you have that on the battlefield um uh, harry destroyed it in response um Tap it to make a th- make a servo into a thopter. Pay three to untap it. Turn that thopter into a uh, construct, and then it dies. And but I still feel great. And Harry's sitting there like, oh, 
<laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, it was brilliant. So the second piece of news is uh, that we made a big boo boo, or I really I made a big boo boo in our last episode. <laughs> we were talking about my Enchantress deck, and uh, we we were talking about Solemnity, and also about Authority of the Consoles. And in both of these cases, I used Murderous Redcap as an example. Murderous Redcap is a creature which, when it enters the battlefield, it does two damage to target creature or player uh-huh. i thought it did one damage which uh, so when we we're talking about authority of the consoles gaining you one life every time a creature entered the battlefield we referenced murderous red cap and that was false because it will still kill you it doesn't stop that and um uh this just shows that uh, you should always podcast when you are alert and awake um i knew full well that there was a brilliant interaction between solemnity and murderous red cap and i got it horribly wrong solemnity <laughs> actually makes murderous red cap better because murderous red cap has persist and solemnity stops it getting counters so you can just uh, ah. you can sacrifice it forever and so solemnity <laughs> is actually not my friend when murderous red cap is the winning combo opposite me uh, so goodness that was my blunder um <laughs> Proof that yeah, I'm human. Bad. In case you, in case you wondered, now you, now you know I'm definitely human, and I make <laughs> mistakes. Uh, I'm not, and I don't really understand the rules of magic perfectly. So, uh, <laughs> what? There you go. Oh, I'm cold and afraid. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> that is scary. It hadn't occurred to me because I know that there's other cards like uh, who, there's a green creature that prevents the minus one minus one counters, and there's a new white Malira. creature from Armand Cat. Malira, uh, Vizier of the- Remedies. That's the one. See, Harry does know everything about magic. He's just pretending. Um, but yeah, it hadn't occurred to me that Solemnity does the exact same thing. Yeah, that's yeah, that's hyper scary. So uh, <laughs> this segment is now also called Combo Corner, not just the news. And uh, so we're we're telling you how to infinitely damage your opponents with a uh, as long as you've got a sack outlet and a murderous red cap and a yes. Solemnity or a Vizier of Remedies and a Malira something like that, uh, you will win. Um, anyway, I got that wrong. And now on to the main topic, if you'd like. <laughs> yes. Uh, Let's leave that approach... way behind us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, how to approach upgrading your decks, whether it's homebrew or a precon. Um, so I've recently given my Zada deck. Um, you may or may not have heard us talking about my Zada deck once or twice every single episode. Um, it's a five color deck. Uh, and has ta- has Zada in it, and it does all sorts of crazy shenanigans. Um, so I've recently kind of overhauled it, uh, given it a bit more of a tokeny feel. Um, and so we'll reference a few of the changes I've made throughout the episode. But kind of the the whole theme of the whole episode is changing your decks for the better. Um, what to do, what not to do, and just how to think about it. Yeah. So you uh, you may have listened to episode twelve where we. Uh, we gave you some ideas for restrictions we called it DIY deck building and just gave you some general ideas for how to build decks and sort of how to use restrictions as a source of creativity and uh, so I think that this sort of makes that a series so this is uh, part two so we've we've built our decks and now how do we upgrade them and make them better after we've played them a few times so yeah. we've got a whole list of uh, of things that you might notice while you're playing games and how to uh, adjust your decks based on those things. So Tim, where do we begin? So uh, the first one is uh, when you're playing a game and you've got a card in your hand and you hold it for the whole game and the game ends and you never cast it, you never really saw a chance to cast it, um, you need to think about why were you holding this card? Were you holding it because um, it's very specific use and that use never came up um were you holding it because it was a combo piece that you never really got to get online uh were you holding it just because it doesn't really fit in the deck um there are so many reasons sometimes you think okay i was holding this enchantment removal um all game because my opponents weren't playing enchantments uh, that's not necessarily reason to remove it um because it's important to have enchantment removal uh, for example or maybe you were holding uh, a creature in a tribal deck um, and the reason you never cast it is because every other card you drew was just better and affected the game more and progressed your board state better than the one you were holding. So maybe it's just it's just not as good as the rest of the cards in your deck. Sometimes that means take it out and replace it with something better. Sometimes it means keep it in. It's just this game, it was never supposed to be cast. Yeah, and I think that 
we, we've talked before about um, looking at the meta around you, looking at the decks that your opponents are playing and the people that you play with most. And like you said, if if you're not seeing a lot of enchantment cards, if you play with the same group every week and nobody's got enchantments in their deck, maybe you yeah. need less enchantment removal. So if yeah. you know if you've been listening to the Command Zone or uh, or other well known podcasters or us, and we say that enchantment <laughs> removal is crucial, uh, but you're not seeing any, then, you know, take these things with a pinch of salt, and uh, you might hold that enchantment removal for ages before you need to cast it. That's just one example. I think that enchantments, yeah. you're more than likely going to see a lot of good enchantments. Yeah. And so maybe that's not the best example. But yeah, if you're if you're just looking at a card for the whole game, that's a bit of an indicator that it's probably ripe for picking out. Yeah, and the other thing to remember with uh, with specifically enchantment and artifact removal, there are often cards that do more than just remove the artifact or enchantment. Um, so maybe if you're just running a raise, which is just one white instant exile target enchantment, um, maybe instead you can run aura mutation or artifact mutation, which are artifact and enchantment removal that also create you um, some tokens or sundering growth um, if you're playing an enchantment deck. Um Back to Zarda, uh, says destroy target artifact or enchantment, then populate. So all three of those cards kind of contribute to another strategy at the same time as being removal uh, to stop your opponent's strategy. So maybe if you are playing a straight up removal spell, think about is there one that's maybe more, more mana or maybe a different colour um, that kind of fits in my deck a little bit better? Yeah, I think that sort of brings us on to strictly better cards. So we use this term quite a lot, strictly better. And what it really means is that in a vacuum, this card is better than this card and that there aren't any circumstances where that's not the case. That's actually a really hard criteria to meet. There are very few cards which in a vacuum are better than other cards which are similar. So an example I've got here is Maker Stand and Rootborn Defences. Both of them cost two and a white. Both of them are instant. Both of them give your creatures indestructible, but Maker Stand gives your creatures plus one, plus O until end of turn. And Rootborn Defences populates, which is uh, if you, you create a token that's a copy of a token that you control. And so in a vacuum, neither of these is better because uh, sometimes you're going to want to give your creatures a little boost on power and sometimes you're going to want an extra token. But I bet that if you are playing a token deck, you're including these cards to make your creatures indestructible. That's the main thing you care about. And so you're going to look towards Rootborn Defences more because it's going to give you an extra token as well. You're going to be less worried about giving your creatures plus one, plus oh. You do get the versatility if you're going really wide of uh, going of giving your creatures more power, and so you're more likely to hit for the win. But I think if you know the reason I would put this in a deck is is as board wipe protection. That's what tokens are usually really vulnerable to, and so more often than not, I'd say that rootborn defenses is better than make a stand. It's not strictly better, but uh, in these circumstances, it's probably a bit better. And so what we're saying is that um, although you're not often going to meet strictly better criteria um, yeah you can make a call based on what your deck is doing and see that actually this card is better than this card and so maybe it's good to upgrade from make a stand to rootborn defenses in that situation yeah Um, an example of strictly better might be rampant growth versus thunderherd migration thunderherd migration is one and a green for a sorcery which says as an additional cost to cast thunderherd migration reveal a dinosaur card from your hand or pay one and then search yeah. your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle your library. Rampant Growth costs one and a green for a sorcery, and it just says that second bit. It just says search your library for a basic land card and put that card onto the battlefield yeah. tapped, then shuffle your library. That, I would say, is strictly better than Thunderherd Migration, although yes. if you're playing a dinosaur deck, you're going to be tempted to put Thunderherd Migration in just because it says dinosaur on yeah. it. And I think unless you're going to... Uh run rampant growth as well uh it's not it's under no circumstances a replacement um because uh there's just more criteria to meet uh to make this card uh good mm. um so you have to have a dinosaur otherwise it costs three mana um so rampant growth and thunder herd migration both go in the dinosaur decks because because they're both rampant growths in that deck um but rampant growth is strictly better um because it has less it costs less mana most of the time um a really good online resource um, if you want to learn about uh, kind of some more cards that are strictly better than other cards is uh, in the margins on EDH Rec. Um, mm. They talk about 
they talk about exactly what we've just said um so yeah if, if that's something you're more interested in um it is in upgrading your deck um while keeping the deck kind of the same just tuning the cards so that they're easier to cast or they do more um that's a good in the margins it's a good resource yeah so that's an article series written possibly by dana roach or maybe it's i think it's dana roach um so uh, dana is also a um uh, co-host on the edh Redcast, which i really recommend one of my favorite podcasts um so yeah that's uh, that's one thing you can be looking at when upgrading your decks are there better versions of the cards you're already playing are there cards which yeah. suit your theme more so the next thing to consider is uh, if you could start the game with a particular card in your hand would you so the way to think about this is uh, if it's removal, you might not think, oh, I don't need this in the deck unless there's something to remove. But if it's a combo piece uh, and you need this combo piece to win the game or you have a combo and this particular card completely enables it and makes it explosive, um, would you start with it in your hand? And if you, if the answer is yes, you should probably keep it in the deck. Yeah, or maybe it's a reason to not include it in the deck if that card is only good if so if a certain card is only good if there's another card to support it is yeah. it okay to include it so this depends on whether you're having whether you're including tutors in your deck if you've got lots of tutors yeah. in and you're working really specifically towards that game plan great it's probably worth having mm -hmm. it in but if you're not tutoring for your cards and if you're playing in a bit more of a casual play group if you are holding a card in your hand, waiting for the other piece of the combo to come along. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's a good idea to take that out. If those cards are only good when they're together, it might be good to look at other cards that could replace them. Yeah, Possibly absolutely. that's uh, two sides of the coin there. Yeah, and, and the third side of the coin, um, <laughs> the third side of the three-sided dice, um, is maybe you do need to keep that in the deck maybe you need to be running redundancies uh, if if this card is how you win the game um maybe you need to find more cards to do the exact same thing uh so that if you don't draw one you might draw the other um so an example for this for my zada deck is zada hedron grinder which is the whole point of the deck says whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell that targets only zada copy that spell for each other creature you control that spell could target each copy targets a different one of those creatures. So if you cast a spell that says, give haste and draw a card, you do that for all your creatures and you draw a card for each of those creatures, which is great. And Ink Tread and Nephilim says almost the exact same thing, except it's not just when you cast a spell targeting it, it's when anyone casts it. So if Harry casts a lightning bolt on my Ink Tread and Nephilim, first of all, you say, Harry, why are you running lightning bolt? We're playing EDH. And then you say, Oh, all my creatures are dead because you've just lightning bolted all of them. So his one mana spell becomes a board wipe. Uh, and there's a dragon that does the exact same thing as this. So I don't run these cards. Uh, if they didn't, if they weren't as bad as I've just described, I definitely would run them because it's just more redundancy. Yeah, sure. And it depends entirely on um, what your deck's trying to do. If there Absolutely. are multiple copies of cards which have your game plan written on them, it makes sense. Yeah. To, to run them. I've got a Slimefoot, the Stowaway EDH deck, which says whenever a Sapriling dies, a, each opponent loses a life and you gain a life. That, so that's my game plan. I want to be sacrificing Sapralings. Um, and so yeah. I've also got Blood Artist and Zulaport Cutthroat, um, and I'm thinking about putting Falcon Wrath Noble in the deck. And these are cards which say whenever a creature dies, opponents lose life, you gain life. And so you're more likely to get to your win condition faster you have to sacrifice yeah. less creatures and so that's just redundancy and that's uh, that's a good thing to consider absolutely side note i've played against that slime foot deck and it's a lot of fun <laughs> oh it's so yeah. much fun it's so it's really good <laughs> so a general rule we often try to stick by is having 10 draw cards and 10 ramp spells so card, yeah. cards which draw you other cards and cards which get you more mana um so when upgrading the deck, you could probably consider if you can deviate from this rule, or if you need to deviate from this rule. Is your yeah. commander uh, does your commander have an activated ability, and so you're it's really mana hungry, and you need more ramp spells? Do you need fifteen ramp? That's a good way to deviate upwards. Or if, uh, for example, with Tim Zada deck, um, he's got lots of cantrips in. Is this a way you can deviate away from that? Do you want to explain that a bit, Tim? Yeah. So um, when I was kind of first 
changing the deck up um and i said to harry i've I'm actually only running eight draw spells and harry's like you need to put more in um and i did put more in uh, i don't know whether it was the correct decision because uh the cantrips uh because i'm creating lots of tokens a cantrip by the way is anything that says draw a card at the end of whatever else the card says um so I've got loads of tokens. Um, I've got so many different ways of adding tokens uh, to the board. And since the upgrade, probably double the amount of token creating cards. Um, so one cantrip can draw me 10 to 15 cards, at least. Um, Harry's seen it countless times where I've drawn 25 cards at once. And I've mm. got to be really careful not to de- uh, draw all my cards and lose the game. So I don't need more draw spells because... Only one. I only really need to cast one, and then I've got the rest of the pieces in my hand because mm-hmm. the deck is just full of redundancies, as we were just saying before. So drawing a quarter of my deck, it doesn't guarantee anything, but I'm very likely to have at least one or two win conditions in my hand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the idea with that is, so you're trying to spam out loads of tokens, and so because there are so many cards which do that, as soon as you cast one cantrip on Zarda, it's inevitable. You've got you've got everything you need. Yeah. Yeah. And to go back slightly um, with the ramp, um, I'd find it very difficult uh, to ever find a situation where you don't want at least 10 ramp spells um, because without mana, you don't cast spells. Um, So unless your deck is playing everything that costs zero, um, there's no reason you wouldn't want uh, ramp spells because I think if you added up the amount of mana spent, I've said this before, if if you took a tally of how much mana each player spent at the end of a game, not always, but the odds are that the person who won probably spent the most mana um, because they mm-hmm. just played more cards, they contributed to their board more, and that's probably why they won. Oftentimes. So ramp is almost always important. And I, I would argue maybe more than 10 ramp spells. I think the, the number 10 is kind of the baseline, at least 10 ramp spells, but I don't think you can have too many. Unless you're running 40 ramp spells and that's all you're doing, then maybe you're running too many ramp spells. <laughs> Yeah, I tend to agree. I tend to aim for somewhere between 10 and 15. Obviously, you don't want to flood out with ramp spells. It's quite easy to do if you put too many in. But yeah, somewhere between 10 and 15 is a good rate. And I think we're going to come back to this a little bit later on as well about uh, making sure you've got enough card draw and ramp. So the next thing that we want to consider when upgrading the deck is uh, what does the card contribute to our win condition and how does it help us get there? Yeah, Uh, so this is something that has absolutely been on my mind uh, because I've had this deck um, with 100 cards for maybe six or seven months where I've really enjoyed playing it. And every time a card, I think, oh yeah, that didn't really fit in the deck. It didn't really win me. It's taken out. So now I've kind of got this this, this box of 100 cards and every single card is in there for a specific reason and they all contribute towards my win condition. Um, so now instead of having to evaluate, uh, does it contribute? to my win condition because all the cards do I have to say what does it contribute and how much does it contribute um, so it's been really difficult to think alright does this card is it better than this one and this one and this one and this one and if I want to put it in what what do I take out mm-hmm. uh, so you have to kind of evaluate whether you're, whether this card does it make you win um, and that's not necessarily does this card win the game when you play it mm-hmm. rampant growth doesn't actually win you the game when you cast it all you do is get a land Uh, but it furthers what you're doing uh, in the game. Yeah, I think there's a little disclaimer to add here that uh, sometimes winning the game isn't always the most important thing. A lot of players do play just to do big, crazy, weird things and have interesting interactions, and that's great as well. We applaud that and we love that, but um, for most people, the aim of the end of the game is to be the winner, and so we want everything to, to... be gearing towards that and that doesn't like tim says necessarily mean that the card has to have written on it you win the game it doesn't have to have your (laughs) win con sort of in in brackets that uh you know saying this card does add to something which is directly going to win you the game rampant growth is part of the win condition you're starting on your win condition from the very beginning of the game and so a really good way to uh sort of explore this concept is with quadrant theory so um limited resources another fantastic podcast talk about quadrant theory in terms of limited and i think that it also applies to edh and so the quadrants are developing behind when you're at parity and when you're at head so developing is like at the beginning of the game when your board is just when you're casting your rampant growth when you are drawing your first few cards to make sure you've got enough uh, enough going to actually get 
get into the game you know we start with zero lands we've got to make sure that we get enough to actually cast our spells the next one behind is when your all of your opponents are ahead of you when you have the the weakest board state when you have you know you're at a card disadvantage compared to everybody else at parity is uh in limited this is when you're often um there's a board stall you and your opponent both have the same number of creatures you can't attack past each other and it could be like that in edh or it could just be that everyone's sort of at an impasse you've you've made a deal that says you can't attack this person until you know the next two rotations of the table and that means that because of that you're at parity there are all sorts of things that could cause that in edh and i think that being at parity uh this is you know when you're when you're in the same space as everybody this is the thing that's most common in edh you're going to be at parity with at least one other player more often than not um yeah. and then the third one is ahead this is when you are ahead of all of your opponents when you've got the most dominating board state you are the most scary player you've got the biggest threat on the table or it might be that you are in the perfect position to play your combo spell you might be waiting patiently just for the right time to do it when you know that the blue player is tapped out. That could also possibly class as a head in EDH. Yeah. It's not always being a head on board that counts. And so according to these things, we you know we can evaluate what's most important in the cards we're wanting to put into our deck. Um, I would yeah. say probably that behind and at parity are the most important because that's where you're going to be most of the time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you don't want... As you were saying earlier, if you've got cards in your hand that uh, you're wondering what to do with them, um, those are the those are the times behind in parity where you're really going to experience drawing a card and thinking, oh great, anything but this because this doesn't do anything at the moment. Yeah. Um, whether that's whether that's a ramp spell or something that helps when you're still developing, or worse, something that is only good when you're ahead. Um, so that's something you have to be really careful about. And these are called win more cards. Um, mm. We were, we were looking for some win more cards in my Zarda deck. Um, and we were actually struggling to find any. Uh, but thinking back, uh, even because even it was not that long ago looking for them, but I think a lot of the cards in the deck are win more. Um, it's just difficult to um, find them because partly because I'm so attached to the cards. But I think the one that most stands out is Second Harvest. Um, mm -hmm. This is an instant for two green green. And it says, for each token you control, put a token onto the battlefield that's a copy of that permanent. So double all your tokens, um, not just your creature tokens as well. Clues and uh, gold, treasure. treasure, yeah, gold. Yeah, all of them and um, double them, which is incredible. Um, this is really rubbish. If you have one token out, say you have a servo out and you pay four mana to make another one one servo. That's just that's pants. Uh, even worse, if you have no tokens, it does absolutely nothing. Yeah. At the same time, if you have 10 tokens, you're not necessarily winning the game with 10 tokens and you pay four mana, you now have 20 tokens. So it feels win more, but at the same time, that might be the difference between you not winning the game and you winning the game or you not doing your really crazy combo and, and you doing it. Yeah, and so it could be that this second harvest takes you from being at parity to being ahead. Yes. And so it's yeah, not absolutely. necessarily win more. And so win more is uh, quite an interesting um, concept because it depends entirely on the deck. So I had, uh, in my mono green Selvala deck, I had Crater Hoof Behemoth, which said whenever, uh, when it enters the battlefield, you get, um, your creatures get plus X, plus X, where X is the number of creatures you control, and Trample. Um, my creatures were already being given Trample uh, by other things, and they were already enormous. And so what Crater Hoof was achieving was almost nothing. And it was only good when I was ahead. Um, it didn't progress my board state to a point where I was ready to start winning. It only worked when I was already sort of winning. And so, yeah, second harvest could definitely be considered a win more card. And if you're ahead, it's only going to put you further ahead. Um, but being that much further ahead might not be, you, you might already be winning, in which case it's sort of a dead card at both ends of the spectrum. But while you're at yeah. parity, it might just be what you need to propel you there. And so, yeah, it could be uh, could be win more or it could not be. It depends entirely on the situation you're in um, and where, where you are in, in the quadrant. Another um, potentially win more card, uh, and I think more so than Second Harvest in the Zada deck, is Mirror Gallery. Uh, it's five mana for an artifact. All it says is the legend rule doesn't apply and the legend rule being if you have two legendary permanents with the same name sacrifice one of them um i think this is win more because if i've got lots of legendary tokens that i'm having to get rid of that means i've got lots of 
legendary things already. Um, so I have lots of token creators, um, and when you cast a token creator on Zarda, it copies it for all my creatures. So if I could say Cackling Counterpart, which is one blue blue, create a token of target creature, um, then it does that for all my creatures. If I have 30 one ones out, I've now got 60 one ones out because I've created a token of all of them. Um, maybe 30 was a bad example because that's definitely ahead. Um, but regardless, and if I cast this to Zarda and I have lots of legendary creatures out like Moldrotha and Kess Dissident Mage and Noy and Da, um, then I get copies of those, but they die immediately. Uh, but if I have the Mirror Gallery out, I get to keep all of these new legendary creatures. But does that matter? Because I already had them out in the first place and they're already doing quite a lot. Do I need five Moldrothers? I mean, yeah, I've always want five Moldrothers, but do I need it to win the game? Does it take me from parity to ahead or does it just take me from ahead to slightly further ahead? Yeah, really worth considering. And so um, we said that behind and parity being the most important, I'd say that behind is the most important to have answers to. It's most important to have answers mm. to when you yeah, are behind. Definitely. Because um, if you've just got a whole collection of cards, which if you put them all down, you will be at parity or ahead. That's fine if you've got sort of infinite mana. What you want is big spells which take you from behind to either being at parity or ahead. You want to be, you know, taking yourself from the losing position to getting towards the winning position. And so in a token deck, something like Avenger of Zendikar might be fantastic. This is five green green for a creature which when it enters the battlefield, make a green plant creature token uh, for each land you control. It's also got landfall, so when a land enters the battlefield under your control, you put a 1-1 one, one counter on each plant you control <laughs> and so if you've got 10 lands that's very quickly going to take you from no creatures to a loss of creatures all the creatures yeah, yeah. or yeah. another answer to being behind might be a board wipe if you are the only person without creatures then a board wipe is an amazing spell to cast because yeah. you're going to put your opponents back to where you are so you're taking yourself immediately from being behind to being at parity but it's in the yeah. opposite way instead of putting your board state up to where everyone else is is it's bringing everyone else's board state back down to where yours is and so board wipes yeah. are really important spells because you want them when you're behind. They might be dead spells in your hand when you're ahead, but I think that that's fine. To have When you're ahead is when you want to have the most dead spells in your hand, because then you've got more spells to cast when inevitably somebody casts their board wipe or their Avenger of Sendikar or something else and puts themselves <laughs> up to where you are. Yeah. Um, I, I find it difficult to evaluate Avenger of Sendikar as something that gets you from um, behind to ahead, because it's seven mana, Um so okay, I I'm maybe I'm evaluating it wrong, but I see seven mana as uh, if you if you're able to cast that spell, but at the same time that's not necessarily true because you might have an incredible board state. Someone who was behind casts a board wipe, gets rid of all your creatures. Exactly. Now you're stuck with just seven lands. So Avenger of Sendikar absolutely does get you back up. So yeah, going back, I absolutely evaluate it wrong. Avenger of Sendikar is brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I think that most of the time in EDH, we need to look at these. Um, developing, obviously, is sort of the early game, but I think when you're behind at parity and ahead is sort of most important around turns maybe 6 to 12. I think the game okay. is most often won between sort of turns uh, 10 and 12, but the moves that yeah. lead you to winning the game often happen somewhere between turns 6 to 10. And so yeah. on turn seven, you might have played a land every turn, you might have wrapped, whatever. It could be entirely possible to play an Avengerous Endicar, and that might be the move that wins you the game. Likewise, yeah. casting a board wipe at the right time might be the thing that wins you the game. And so I think uh, that sort of around turn six to ten is when you really want to be taking notice of these things, when you want to look at uh, look at what the other players are doing and what you're doing and think, am I behind? Am I at parity? Am I ahead? And if you notice these things over lots of games, you might find that uh, all of these cards that I've got in my hand that are only good when I'm ahead... I've got them all at turn six and seven and eight, and I don't want to cast any of them because I'm behind. And so yeah. that is a good yeah. place to evaluate your decks from and say, actually, so maybe I need to take some of these win more cards out or cards which are only good when I'm ahead and put in more board wipes, more things which propel me to being ahead in that sort of mid game around turn six to ten. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a really good point. So we're talking there about um, sort of noticing what's going on and testing cards in play and sort of yeah the quadrant theory is a great way to do that but 
um, how many times of playing a game and looking at your, your board at turn 6 to 10 is enough to decide? Uh, we want a big enough sample size. So how many do you reckon? Um, so I used to play with uh, uh, my friend Josh at work um, and he was an incredible deck builder. We usually played um, modern, um, but he his rule was uh, I'm going to test um, 10 times if I, I'm going to play this card in my deck 10 times before I can decide whether it needs to come out or not. Um, and at first I was thinking that's quite a lot. Um, and it wasn't just play, play 10 games with this card in the deck. It was play this card 10 times. Uh, how does it make me feel? Um, what does it do to the game? Obviously evaluating cards is very different uh, between different formats, but the, the concept is the same. Um, I don't test 10 cards. I'm not that patient. I don't, sorry, I don't test uh, a card by playing it 10 times. I'm not nearly patient enough and I don't play enough magic. Um, but I think the things to be careful of, the traps are, oh, last time I played magic uh, and with this deck, I, I flooded out, so I need to take lands out. That's, that's something that I used to do a lot is if I played a game and I ended up with eight lands on turn 10, like, oh, what? I keep drawing lands. I need to take some out. That's absolutely not the answer. That just means that that time in that game, you happen to draw more lands. Um, so testing cards is more about uh, did this card move me from parity to ahead? Uh, did this take me from ahead to winning? Um, did it help me develop? Um, did it did it take me back from behind or did it prevent my opponents from winning? And most importantly, I think, uh, so not getting rid of the quadrant theory, but something that's not to do with the quadrant theory is, uh, did this contribute to my dex strategy um, or or did it just do something really big? So Avenger of Sendikar, while it is an incredible card, if you're not playing a creature deck or you don't care about tokens, we don't care about lands, it's while when you play it, it's really good. Maybe it doesn't win you the game. It just stops you from losing. Yeah, it might slow down the inevitable, and it might um, it might be a lightning rod to stop your opponents from removing something else. But yeah, you're right. If yeah. you're not playing, uh, if you're not playing a token deck, then um, it's maybe not going to do as well as another card might. And you know, the whole point of this is that we're looking to upgrade cards. And if Avenger of Zendikar is just a card that's in there because it's a good card. It's an EDH staple. Maybe <laughs> it's not the right card for that slot. There are, you know, we only want so many cards at the seven mana slot. Uh, maybe there's something which fits your game plan better. Um, I think ten is probably about right. That tends to be where I'm happy with with the testing. But I think you can also draw a lot from previous previous experience with your play group. If you're playing with the same group of four, five, six people on a regular basis, you know what their decks are like. Uh, you know that you've got to tailor your decks towards that sort of play style. And so I think while it's good to play with each card ten times. It might be that yeah. you can also draw on your experience to sort of fill in the gaps and you might come to some conclusions quicker. Something yeah. that is really good to consider is what are the conditions that need to be met for the card to do what you expect it to do? Um, yeah. And so, you know, if you need 10 tokens on the board and mirror gallery and you need to have X cards in hand, <laughs> maybe it's not a great card in the deck if it if there's a lot of relying on you know your own board or your opponents having things this is something that i'm really trying to do at the moment is make sure that my cards only rely on me and my cards they don't rely on what my opponents are doing to be good hmm. um that's a, be good, that's a really good point because those are conditions that you can't guarantee are going to be met and so you really yeah. want to be considering uh how many how many moving parts do you need in place for this to be good yeah, and it and it's not always uh, oh this card needs four moving pieces to be good. I should take it out. Um, especially if you're just playing casual decks and uh, you just want to have fun, you just want to do crazy things. Mm. Then then absolutely don't take those cards out because they need lots of requirements. Mm. Um, but if you're making if you're trying to make your deck better, if you're trying to make it faster or just more consistent, maybe think about um, whether your card again doesn't do anything until x happens um or x y z a b c d e happens then this card is bonkers and i win the game and i feel like uh, a lot of the cards in my zada deck are absolutely this doesn't do anything unless x y z happens but at the same time all the other cards are also saying the same thing so while if i don't do anything 
the deck doesn't do anything, but I only have to do one or two things because everything cares about the other things. So some things make tokens, some things care about how many tokens I have, some things care about which tokens I have. So the cards are kind of weaved into each other. They, they care about the other cards. So while the deck is not consistent and 100% competitive, it is a very good 70% deck um, that when, when it is at 70%, it wins very spectacularly and i have a lot of fun doing it so i think i think i'm glad at the level it is it's not um i'm going to consistently win on turn five every game it's i'm going to consistently do something this game and a lot of the time i'm going to have a lot of fun and even then some of that time i'm going to crazy win and everyone's going to be talking about it for years and years and years <laughs> maybe not that last part <laughs> I have seen it win in spectacular ways and I'm still talking about one particular <laughs> win you had, so you're right. And actually, <laughs> that's something which is quite fun. If you're looking just to play the deck and eventually win in a spectacular way that people are still going to talk about, fantastic. You know, we love to make yeah. good stories in EDH and so, yeah, cool. So I want to talk about a trap <laughs> okay. And this is a trap which I think Archive Tim trap. falls into quite a lot. I also fall into it quite a lot, and I think a lot of players fall into this trap quite a lot. This is uh, emotional attachment. This is the thing I struggle with absolutely the most. Um, emotional attachment to the cards. Um, do you keep this card in the deck because it was in the first version of the deck? Uh, did you just buy this card? Uh, even for 20p, did you spend 10p on this card, but you feel like you've bought it, so it should go in the deck because you didn't have it before and then you spent money on it? Did you trade for it? Did you open it in a booster pack? Um, there are a myriad of ways of being overly attached to a card and keeping it in the deck for the wrong reason. Um, I've got a list of cards, if you'll indulge me, of cards that shouldn't be in my deck and have since been taken out, but it hurt. It was like a wrench in my heart, Harry. So Elvish Mystic, <laughs> Lanor Elves, two uh, cards that came out of the deck. I'm just, it's like a, this is like a speech for you guys. Jelectrode, I'm sorry. I'll miss you. This is a speech um, <laughs> for your fallen, <laughs> that, your fallen brothers My fallen arms. cards that have been taken out of the deck. <laughs> Dramatic reversal and Ice Conceptor. You will always be my favourite infinite combo. <laughs> Naya Charm. You're just not that good. <laughs> there are so many cards that are taken out of the deck and it hurts. Um, the, the one that hurt the most is, uh, and I think it hurt a lot because I talked about it so much in episode one when we talked about this deck. And it's Scuttle Mutt. I'm going to read it because uh, I just love this card. If you haven't heard this card, um, it's three mana for a 2-2 artifact creature, Scarecrow. And it says, tap, add one mana of any color to your mana pool. So that's great. But it also says, target creature, oh, tap, target creature becomes the color of your choice in until end of 10. That's, that doesn't mean anything, but it's so much fun. And once it made some, it messed someone up. So I was like, this card is so good. It's staying in the deck. Um, but it was one of the last cards to come out when I was doing my upgrades. And honestly, I, it's still in the box with the rest of the deck, just in case I change my mind. Oh, I do that as well. <laughs> I keep a, I, I keep a sort of sideboard, like a maybe board. Cards which I've taken out, which I'm not sure if I really want to get rid of them yet. Yeah. <laughs> you heard the emotion in Tim's voice there. He loves these cards <laughs> and he loves the sort of the game that they create. But they are so specific and they're so narrow in what they can do. And so... Sometimes, even though you really like a card, it's not right to keep it in the deck. And there are cards which should just do the job better. Or maybe it's an effect which you don't need at all anyway. Um, I mean, there are, of course, exceptions to this rule. Uh, you know, if you've just got your pet cards, great, put them in. But yeah. uh, if you're really looking to upgrade, you really need to think about whether or not those cards should stay in or not. Um, if you want to know to the extent that I really didn't want to take this deck apart. Um, if it didn't, if if money wasn't a thing, and if it was just space, I 100% would have built another version of this deck before I upgraded it. I'd have kept this little, <laughs> this would have been a, a snapshot of this deck and it would never change. And then I have another version. Um, but because I put all my expensive lands, uh, every single one I own, because it's five color in this deck and, and I, couldn't, I couldn't afford that. It would be stupid. But I genuinely considered making two of these decks 
That is Don't dedication. do that, guys. It's stupid. That well, is stupid. you'd probably end up just playing one more than the other, and it would probably be the better version of the deck. Yeah, absolutely. Why so would can, I ever play the worst version? It can live version? happily in your memory. For... I've got... I've got the deck list saved, so it's okay. Perfect. <laughs> so if the uh, if the deck that you've built isn't running properly, this is this is something that I'm quite interested in, particularly because I've had a couple of decks recently which didn't do what I hoped. They didn't do what, what I planned them to do. If you've got a deck like that, uh, you, you're definitely going to want to upgrade. And something that I would... Um, say is the first thing to do is you know we, we can look to we can look to cut these emotional cards and uh, we can try and try yeah. and upgrade to strictly better cards but actually one of the most important things I find is card draw and mana ramp uh, if you've got less than 10 immediately go to that deck and put put minimum 10 card draw spells and 10 ramp spells in yeah but maybe uh you know, maybe the deck's really mana hungry. Maybe you need to draw lots of cards because maybe if your curve is really low and you're you're spilling out all of your cards in turns one to four, you're going to need extra card draw to make sure that you've got more cards. You, you keep refilling your hand and make sure you've got cards enough yeah. for turns five, six, seven and onwards. Absolutely. And so I think if the deck isn't doing what you planned it to do, the first thing that you need to look at is is the card draw and the ramp. Absolutely, yeah. Um um, if you've listened to, I think, maybe one episode of The Command Zone, you'll have heard them say you need 10 draws and 10 ramp. Um, and and sometimes that's absolutely correct. Sometimes you need more. And like we said earlier, maybe sometimes you need less. But Harry's absolutely correct. Uh, if your deck isn't doing what you wanted it to do or if you're not doing anything at all, those are definitely the first places to look about maybe why it's not doing anything. Yeah, and actually that's a really good place to test from. If you're if you're wanting to test your deck more, a good way to test it is to make sure that you see more of the cards. And so having more card draw and having more ramp in order to cast more spells is going to be a good way to be able to test the deck. And so actually, when I build a new deck, I really do err on the side of caution with, with card draw and mana ramp. Because I know that I can remove that later and put some more splashy cards in. But I'm not going to know if I can do that if I never get to cast those spells or even draw them and look at them in my hand and find that, oh, there's no opportune moment to cast this. Maybe I'll put something else in. So uh, I think that's just a good baseline. That's a good place to work from when you're upgrading your deck. Other things that you need to consider when you do actually get round to upgrading the deck is... um, one that you don't go below that 10 ma- ten card draw, yeah, 10 mana ramp for sure. threshold. But also your curve. Whenever I upgrade the deck to any real extent, I try and lay the cards out in curve, have all the have all the one one spells in one column, all the two mana spells in another, or the three color, uh, three mana, etc. And there might be, you might want to split them up into categories. You might, might want to make sure that you have no less than 10 recursion spells or no less than 10 token producers. And I think it's really helpful yeah. to lay the cards out and see uh, see what the curve looks like, because it's really easy to start upgrading the deck and taking out all of your three CMC spells and putting in loads of five and six and seven CMC spells because they are in quotes better. Um, yeah. But if you're ruining your curve to upgrade the deck, it's definitely not an upgrade. You really need to keep that curve. And this is something that I have just found to be so important recently: is keeping a consistent mana curve and the lower the better in some decks especially if you've got green in the deck you can afford to have a higher mana curve but uh, but yeah something to really consider when you're upgrading is not to break up that curve not to end up with a big dip at three where you should have a big bulge yeah that's something that's something i definitely struggle with um I've, i'm i'm I, I i'll think oh yeah this card needs to go in and this card needs to go in i'll take those out and then 15 cards later you look at it and you're like, oh i haven't got any four drops so on turn four, I just do nothing. That's exactly. Or I have to cut. I have to have a three drop and a one drop, or two two drops, to do anything on this turn of of reasonable value. Exactly. Um, the next the next really important thing um, to consider is how many lands you're running. It's so easy to think, oh, this card's so good and it's better than the basic land. So I should definitely change it for a basic land. And uh, I remember, I think it was actually when we started doing this podcast. Um, I I went through all my decks and I realised in my rune deck. Uh, which is quite mana hungry. It's very mana hungry. I'd gone down from about 36 lands to 32 lands. And this is the first time I've told anyone this, and I'm very sorry, world, (laughs) for running 32 lands. So I laid the deck out and I was like, I have to take at least four, maybe five deck, my five cards out of this deck and put more lands in. And Mm -hmm. I I did that for all my decks. And I realized how incredibly 
uh, uncareful I'd been about changing my decks because I'd get a new card from a booster pack or I'd be like, oh, this goes in the deck, I should take out a mountain. Um, it's really dangerous and, and do keep an eye on how many lands. If you've got, if you can get an app, uh, so I've got I've got a deck building app and it tells me how many lands I've got and I try not to go below thirty six. I think thirty six is minimum thirty five if you're playing a very low mana intensive deck or uh, my Mizix deck, which is a very cheaty deck, cheats mana. Uh, I run thirty five lands, but yeah, count your lands. <laughs> yeah, never. This is just a golden rule. I have fallen foul of this a lot of times, and this is another trap that's really easy to fall into my golden rule is I never take out a land to put a spell in. When I build the deck, uh, I, I follow a basic principle of um, either, you know, I, I look look at a lot of factors as to how many lands I want, but a really quick rule to follow is uh, 30 lands plus the CMC of your commander plus the number of colours in your commander's casting cost. Ah, okay. So if you've That's, got a... Oh, and I had that before. So, for example, Muldrotha is a 6 CMC commander, and it's three colours, so you're going to need 39 lands. Another way of looking at it is uh, start with 45 lands wow. and take out a land for each source of mana ramp doubled. So for each two sources of mana ramp, take out a land. Do you see what I mean? Ah, uh, yeah, okay, cool. I thought you meant um, if you have 10 mana ramp, take out 20 lands. I was like, no, that's that's definitely wrong. But no, yeah, no, no. so the other way around. Yeah. So yeah. Sol Ring and Felwar Stone means you can take out one land. And so I've okay, heard that. And so that means that for if you've got 10 sources of mana ramp, you're going to want 40 lands. And actually, I think that I think a lot of players are heading this way. I think more lands is normal. A lot yeah. of my decks have no less than 37, um, and some of my decks have 39 lands, and that doesn't feel like too many, even yeah. in decks which don't have lots of activated abilities, for example. I I, re- I really like that one. So you actually run 39 lands in your Muldrotha deck? Uh, Muldrotha in particular, I think, is 38. My Enchantress deck is possibly 39. Um, wow. I've just built a, an Ailey deck. That's an activated ability. That's 39 lands, no question. I'm tempted to put 40. Oh, really? So, yeah, more, because more... Ailey's whole thing is activated abilities that cost mana. Exactly, yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah, you definitely evaluate lands better than me. I think 36 will do. <laughs> well, but the thing is, like, you can really go in depth on that. If you just follow that basic principle of 30 lands plus the CMC, plus the number of colours, That's you're going to be fine with that. That's, that yeah. is definitely enough. It's just if you so, really want to go in depth, you, there are a lot of things you consider. So going back to the uh, 10, 10 games testing rule, uh, if you find yourself 10 games in a row flooded, or 10 games in a row, uh, the other one, what's the other one called? Screwed, mana screwed? Screwed, mana screwed, that's the one. Uh, wow, <laughs> mind blank. Um, do, you, do you change it, or do you think, no, that's coincidence... Or do you think actually maybe I am running too many or not enough lands? Yeah, definitely. I actually really do consider that. And something I I don't actually do it anymore, but I did for a while keep a tally on my on my phone, on my notes on my phone for each of my decks. And I gave I gave the deck a score uh if it was flooded. So every time it was flooded, it got a plus one. And every time I okay. was mana screwed, I got a negative one. And so okay. uh after ten games, if I had an average of plus two plus three i knew i needed to take a land out and that would bring that average back down and likewise if i was in the negatives if if my average over 10 games was like negative two or three or four i need to put another land in or possibly add more ramp reminds me of the um the guy i can't remember who it was but they got a uh, a mana crypt which is a very expensive card but it deals damage to you and taps for mana Mm. and uh, they got a very heavily played one so they they wrote win on one side and loss on the other and drew a line down the middle yeah. and every time they lost because of this card they gave a tally yeah. on one side brilliant that's awful don't do that please don't do that <laughs> if you do do that send us pictures because that sounds hilarious um so yeah that's that's a really good idea that's a, that's something i might do um definitely lands is one of the hardest things to kind of get your head around um when i was upgrading zada it originally had 35 lands in um it's a five color deck that's quite mana intensive and i was only running 35 lands so I, I put another one in um i don't plan on putting more in um because the games i've played since have been have worked really smoothly i've got lots and lots of ramp in the deck so i feel like 36 is a 
a happy medium and I just would not know what cards to take out. <laughs> I love getting to that point with a deck where you don't feel like you can upgrade it anymore. And, but then yeah. but then you find a card which has to go in and then you've got to wrestle and you've got to really you've got to work out <laughs> what on earth you've got to take out it's so frustrating but when you when you've got a deck at that point it's really satisfying because you know that this is possibly the best version of that deck yeah it's absolutely yeah and and then a new set comes out and you're like damn it it's five cards in that set i want to put in <laughs> yeah i'm particularly like that with green and black cards there's always cards i want to put into my pet green and black deck and there's never i need yeah. i need to be able to play 200 card edh just for my golgari deck <laughs> oh man that sounds terrible um so another thing uh, to consider uh, changing your deck is whether you, it should be downgraded and uh, this Ooh. is really really tricky um is your deck being absolutely hated is every time you get it out does everyone go oh and then uh, you lose immediately. One thing to do would be just don't play that deck for a while, let people forget about it, play some other really unpowerful decks, lose a lot and gain everyone's favor back. Um, that's not very fun, so maybe you downgrade the deck. And when I say downgrade, I don't mean put worse cards in or... Um, take lands out. Take, la take <laughs> lands out so you never get to cast anything or only put seven drops or higher in. Um, those are all possible ways of downgrading a deck uh, for me downgrading means do i have an infinite combo take that out do i have a combo that's two cards and i usually win with this combo take that out um it's hard and uh i'm maybe a little bit too much on one side so i beat harry with uh, an enchantment that says whenever a creature enters a battlefield deal one damage and i played it won with it immediate and i was like oh i want to take that out because that's that's boring and harry's like why did you take that out you won and and then looking at the board i realized it wasn't just this one enchantment that won the game it was the three spells i cast before it it was the all the creatures i had out mm -hmm. it was a it was a big combo that required a lot of pieces it just felt bad because i cast one enchantment and won the game yeah sometimes uh sometimes it, it it does feel bad just to suddenly win out of nowhere but you're right like the whole game has been gearing towards this point i think this is an argument that people use against uh, combo players quite a lot is that the combo came out of nowhere but what they haven't seen is that the combo player has had that card in their hand for ages and they've been waiting for the right moment and they've been yeah. they've been countering spells which will ultimately lead to them not to their combo not working and um they've been waiting really carefully and then they cast it and so to everybody else at the table it's out of it's out of no way just suddenly the game's ended and that player's won but to that player they have been carefully timing this game yeah. they've been working hard through the developing stages they might have been behind at times they've got to parity and then they've just suddenly put themselves ahead so much that they've won and um, yeah and that so that's an argument that people use against that but actually uh, i think at times it's okay because you know development counts in a game yeah, that's, that's all. It's all part of the game, which counts towards you winning. And so, back to the quadrant theory, you know, you might just play that one enchantment and and suddenly put yourself so so far ahead that you win. <laughs> but you're right; it's all those other things that you've been developing towards that that count yeah. as well. Sometimes I think that downgrading your deck can be upgrading your deck. So, Sanguine Bond is a card which um, combos infinitely with another card called Exquisite Blood. One says when you gain life, each opponent loses that much life, and the other one says when each opponent when an opponent loses life, you gain that much life. So as soon as you gain or lose a bit of life, uh, everyone loses the game in instantly because of the infinite yeah. damage dealt like that. And uh, I had Sanguine Bond in a deck without exquisite blood because i don't want to have that combo which is fine some people like it some people don't and uh, so i took sanguine bond out because you get hate just for playing that one people see that and they start coming towards you and so yeah. sometimes downgrading your decks is actually a good thing because uh, you're going to get less hate directed towards you, which actually might lead you to winning more games ultimately. Absolutely, yeah. It's a multiplayer format. It's, politics matters in this in this game. Definitely. And so, yeah, some of, some of the decks that I win with are the ones that seem sort of less powerful. It's quite yeah. rare that I win with my top tier decks with the expensive cards in. It's the decks yeah. that sort of come out of nowhere that are more likely to glean a win, I think. My opponents might disagree and my playgroup uh, might have other ideas. But uh, for me, it seems like... <laughs> I, the other thing is, 
it's more fun when you when you win with that slightly less powerful deck i find it yeah. more fun and so yeah you could turn up with your perfectly tuned deck but isn't it going to be a little bit more satisfying if you have to eke out the win and uh, yeah. and you you yeah. weren't even expecting to win yeah and i think i think the other thing to remember is um you uh, don't let other people's um disdain for your win uh taint uh whether whether you like how you won or not um, exactly i won with a a tainted strike um and my opponent uh, made the point of how it's pretty boring and I, I actually agreed with him and i took tainted strike out I'd, I'd done the thing i'd killed someone with tainted strike mm-hmm. um it's time to replace that with something else um but at the same time if i didn't agree with them um then i could say well that's okay that's how you feel but actually it, that felt really good. I paid one black mana and you died. Um, and that's what I want to do. So keep that in. Don't let other people's um, bad reaction to you winning uh, affect how you build decks and how you upgrade and downgrade decks. Yeah, one of the uh, one of the guys that I play with uh, a lot, patron of the show, Steve, uh, has a wicked <laughs> combo deck. And it's it's well-tuned and it's, it's actually really fun to play against. It's uh, really frustrating. Um, I do tease him a lot, and every time he gets a card out, I, I make sure I tell the table, well, that's a combo piece. That's a combo piece. Um, but I I always try not to be too salty when he when he wins with it, because even though yeah. to me it seems like it's out of nowhere, like, you know, he has tried really hard to win with that, and you've just got to remember that your opponents are there to have fun as well. And so... Uh, yeah. So if you you know if you treat your opponents like that, and hopefully they'll treat you in the same way, uh, don't take on board disdain for your for your win, your win condition, or your combo, or however you've done it. If you've just uh, made loads of tokens and won with overrun, um, if your opponents don't like that, sure, okay, not so great, but don't let that taint the way you build your deck. Don't upgrade or downgrade your deck based on those things either. Yeah, that's so, that's right. a good point, Tim. So. To conclude the uh, the deck upgrades uh, topic, um, something that I've told myself a lot um, throughout the process of upgrading this starter deck, um, I had to say it regularly to remind myself, it goes back to the emotional attachment to cards, but at the same time, um, not necessarily emotional attachment. Um, they talked about it in the first episode of the EDH rec um, podcast, and it's the pre-con uh, upgrade when you upgrade a precon deck, um, do you keep the card in there just because it's already in there? Um, not necessarily because you're emotionally attached to it, uh, but just because you know it came in the precon, so it must go in the deck. Um, so the question I've been asking myself is, would you buy this card if you didn't already have it in the deck? Um, so taken out of the deck, you look at this card, you think, if I didn't own this, if I found this online, would I think I'm gonna buy this card to put in this deck? If the answer is no, Unless you're thinking, because I don't want to spend any money and this is really expensive and I own it, so I'm not going to buy it. The answer is probably take it out of the deck. Because Mm. if you wouldn't put it in there because you didn't own it, you're probably only keeping it in there because you do own it. And obviously it's okay to not buy cards and save money and just keep the deck how it is. But if you're trying to upgrade a deck, really think about why the card is in there. And And for me, the biggest, the thing I found the most hard was, am I keeping this in the deck? Because I have played it once before and I liked it but actually it doesn't win me the game and I'm only really keeping it in there because it's in there. Yeah so I I hope that uh, in this episode we have given you some ideas of how you can upgrade your decks. There are so many different strategies and so many cards uh, especially that are available to us playing EDH that uh, it's so difficult to say, you know, this card is good in this strategy and this is good in this strategy. But I hope we've given you uh, some ideas of where to look to upgrade your decks and how you might yeah. go about doing it. I hope that we've given mm-hmm. you some strategies that you might not have think, thought about before and some uh, some sort of some techniques to, to sort of tune up and, and make your decks yeah, yeah. better and hopefully more fun to play. And I think that that is something that's really important, something that uh, I've heard a few people say is... Um, At the end of each game, look at, you know, talk to your opponents and say, did you have fun? And ask yourself, did I have fun? That is the best measure you can have of how your deck is performing. Um, And so we're not just looking at making our decks better. We're looking at making them more fun. And so, you know, for some people, making your deck more tuned to win might not be the best way to make it more fun. And so uh, including those janky cards that uh, are actually cards that you love and you've always owned, so you have to put them in your deck. 
sometimes that's okay <laughs> and that's important for yeah. us to note as well yeah absolutely that's a good point on the upgrading your decks note, we've got a card of the week. And so we always like to bring you a card which not many people know about, which seems to be flying under the radar and something that we think we should see a little bit more play. And on the yeah. upgrade theme, we've got Deadwood Tree Folk. And the reason this is in the upgrade theme is because I think it's awfully similar to Green Warden of Murasa. So I'll, <laughs> I'll read Green Warden of Murasa first and you can hear Deadwood Tree Folk afterwards and you might hear some similarities. Green Warden is four green green for an elemental creature. It's a five four. When it enters the battlefield you may return target card from your graveyard to your hand and when it dies you may exile it. If you do return target card from your graveyard to your hand. Uh, cool. So uh, this is two graveyard recursion spells on one card but you have to yeah. exile the card when it dies to get the other one. You've also got to make it die. Dead with Tree Folk is five and a green for a Tree Folk creature. It's a three six with vanishing three, which means it enters the battlefield with three time counters on it. And at the beginning of your upkeep, you remove one. And when the last is removed, you sacrifice it. It says when Deadwood Tree Folk enters the battlefield or leaves the battlefield, return another target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. And so with Deadwood Tree Folk, it has to be a creature. And with Green Warden, it can be any card. But Green Warden doesn't get rid of itself, and Deadwood Tree Folk does. And I would say that in the majority of green decks, Deadwood Tree Folk is going to be a better card. One, because it removes itself. You don't necessarily need a sack outlet. And also because a lot of the cards in your graveyard are going to be creature cards. Yeah. And thirdly, you can get Deadwood Tree Folk back onto the battlefield, whereas Green Warden of Morassa to get the second trigger has to be exiled which means you can't recur it yes absolutely i actually have a really nice loop with deadwood tree folk and either uh, eternal witness or uh, skull winder each of which when they enter the battlefield you get a card out of your graveyard uh, deadwood tree folk <laughs> because it gets two cards out of the graveyard while it's uh, out and about uh, you can with skull winder in your graveyard as well you can use deadwood tree folk to get skull winder out and then skull, cast Skullwinder to get something else out, and then sacrifice Skullwinder, and then sacrifice Deadwood Tree Folk to get Skullwinder back out, and the loop goes on and on and on, and it's wonderful. You can't do that with Green Warden. And so, yeah, if you want to get Instance of yeah. Sorceries, or, in fact, Artifacts and Enchantments, then sure, Green <laughs> Warden might be better, but for the same mana cost and a slightly easier to cast creature, I recommend playing Deadwood Tree Folk. This is an awesome card that I don't think sees enough play. No, and one last note because, you know, you haven't had enough about these two cards, uh, is in a flicker deck, so Rune, for example, will trigger Deadwood Tree Folk when it enters the battlefield and when you flicker it That's disgusting. and when it comes back. But Green Warden of Morassa only triggers when it enters uh, and it ha the other way is dies, so it means it has to be killed. So Deadwood Tree Folk, you flicker it, leaves, you get a thing, it comes back, you get a thing. Yep. Every single time. Absolutely. And it comes back with three vanishing things. So you can flicker it again within three turns and it will come back with three vanishing tokens on it. So yeah, nice. <laughs> nice. So I think that is all we've got time for in today's episode. Yeah, I, I think so. It's been a long one. Yeah. But lots to talk about. Yeah, and I think there are actually some topics in here that we could expand upon in future. I love talking about the quadrant theory, and I really do think it applies to EDH, so I've really enjoyed talking about that. Uh, I agree, yeah. So if you want to find us on Twitter, you can find us at TPSMTG. Uh, you can email us at termpapersideways at gmail.com. You can find us on YouTube, and for all of these details and everything else, including maybe a deck list to Tim's updated Zarda deck... Oh, yeah, probably. Awesome. I'll do that. For all of that, see the show notes. <laughs> Tim, is there anything you would like to say to our listeners before we go? Yes. The thing I'm most excited about the Zyder deck is there are seven legendary creatures in the deck, three of which I was thinking about building decks with, and now I don't need to because they're in my favourite deck. Oh, I love I'll doing let you that. see them when you look at the deck list. <laughs> Amazing. Go to the deck list and find out what they are. Tweet us, email us, tell us what you think of that deck list. And indeed, if you've got any of your own ideas for upgrading your decks. So thank you very much for listening and we will talk to you soon. Cheerio.